hold I gaze in awe at the wonders of our love and as I learn the cruel lessons of life Islam shone through as my guide Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah I declare that there is no other God worthy of worship other than Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad is the final messenger of Allah. So we've been talking in the last two episodes, and this is the third one in the series, of my transition from missionary to Muslim. And uh, if you haven't been able to see the first two, perhaps you can go to Peace TV online and have a look, and you may, may be able to see some of the, the previous episodes there. But if you have been watching, then you'll know where we are. But just to give you a quick recap, I grew up in a Christian family, went to a Christian school, became a born-again Christian, got very, very involved in the church from a very young age. Twelve years of my life I spent studying the Bible and studying um, different books of the Bible, studying different doctrines within the Bible. I was involved in many missionary organizations, missionary work, charity work. Um, so I, I was really, really deeply committed to the church. But the catalyst came when I was asked to do a talk uh, for a group of youth. And the group of youth was about, I would say about 3,000 people that were expected at this youth conference. And this youth conference was held, and um, the subject matter that was given to me was male-female relations, how far should we go? So what they actually wanted me to do is to go and have a look through the Bible and find out how far should boys and girls go when they date each other. You see, in Christendom, boys and girls are allowed to date, get to know each other, hold hands, so they be allowed to be hold hands, kiss, hug, touch each other. What are, how far are they allowed to go? or maybe they need to hold little pinky fingers together. What is it that they're allowed to do? What is it that they're not allowed to do when it comes to dating? And so as I prepared my talk and I started doing it, I took a piece of paper and I started to write down the topic. And I wrote on a piece of paper, I wrote there, male-female relations. And I picked up my Bible and I started reading through it, trying to find a verse that said anything about male-female relations. Several hours went past and my blank piece of paper that was in front of me was still blank. I found nowhere that it said male and female relations, in other words, dating, getting to know each other, engagements, was permitted in the way that we understand it in the church today. So I thought, well, let me have a look what other religions have to say. So I took out another book called the Bhagavad Gita, which is a Hindu scripture which is more commonly used amongst the Hare Krishna movement or the International Society of Krishna Consciousness. They use it more. And I read through it and uh, found the same problem. And one of the problems that I found in it was because one minute one of the gods was a male and the next minute one of the gods was a female, the same god. So I thought, well, this book's not going to be of any use to me and I put it down. Then I went to the Book of Mormon, which is the Mormon book. And I went through more many books and eventually I found that I had a whole stack of books and very few, or if any, had anything to do with male-female relations. But behind me, at the back of me, was a bookcase. And on this bookcase at the bottom left hand, or bottom right hand corner of the bookcase was a white book, quite a thick white book. And this white book was still wrapped in plastic, which means I'd never opened it. On the side of it, it had written the Holy Quran. And so I thought, well, let me have a look what this book says. So I picked up this book and I opened it. I don't know what I'm going to be able to find in this book because I don't know my way around it. So I looked at the index and I thought, well, let me look at relationships. And there was no such thing under relationships. So then I looked under the other section and looked at male. And I started reading all the verses that had to do with male. Then I looked at the word female. I looked at all the verses that had to do with female. And what I found was actually quite amazing. First thing, I must be terribly honest when I talk about the Quran. When I opened this book, because this is basically the, exactly the same book that I have here now, the only difference is it had a white cover on this one has a green cover. When I opened this book, something fascinating took place. I didn't understand anything in it. Now, you might be surprised for me to say that, but you see what I said to you in series one of the series, uh, of this series that I'm doing, the episode one of the series that I'm doing, I said in episode one that... What I liked about the Bible is when you opened it, it was like a typical storybook. It had a nice beginning, a nice middle, and a nice end. The Quran doesn't have that. The Quran is a straightforward book. It tells you exactly how to get from point A to B the fastest way possible. You see, the Bible, when you pick up the Bible, it says, for example, if I had to tell you how to get to the shop or how to go to a, a restaurant in your town, I would tell you this would be the Bible way. I would say to you, you go about 15 kilometers along the road in a southeasterly direction, and you'll see a shop on your left-hand side which has a sign that says they open 24 hours a day. On the left-hand side, you'll see a woman selling books. Don't worry about it. You keep going about And so it'll give you a long, long story on how to get there with lots of distractions along the way. However, when it comes to the Quran, 
it gives you that direct route. It will say, go northeast, 125 kilometers, your CSI is saying, open, that's where we are. And so what, I, what was very difficult for me to understand when reading the Quran was how blatant and how straightforward it was without any holding any punches. It wasn't trying to give a soft approach. It was giving the direct approach. And so it was extremely difficult for me to read because it was so blatant. It was like being punched in the face every single time I read a line. Someone, it felt like I was up against a heavyweight boxer. When I read the Bible, it was like being against some child throwing a feather at me. It wasn't hitting me. It was just very, very entertaining. So when I read the Quran, it was blatant, it hit me, it was straight into the face, it directly hit me, and I was scared of this book, and so I put it down after I understood, okay, all I'm going to look at is the male-female relationships, and I'm not interested any further, this book is, is actually quite scary. I remember recently somebody asked me, and he said, I will take the Quran, but it has got a lot to do with hell and punishment in it. And I couldn't lie to the person and say to him, well, it doesn't, so I said to them, well, it has a lot more do's than don'ts in it. And I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but... Next time you read the Quran, see how many do's it has. It has a lot more do's than don'ts. And if you spend your time doing the do's, you won't have time to do the don'ts. So, you have, so that's something for you to chew on, it's going off the subject again. But one of the things that happened when I read the Quran is it had very, very interesting information to tell me about male-female relations. And so I started writing these things down. But then it also got me thinking about how things are in different Christian countries in the world. For example, let's look at Christian countries compared to Muslim countries. And so I started writing notes about this as well. So the day came where I had to stand up before these 3,000 odd boys and girls, and they're all sitting in front of me. Some of them were talking, some of them were chewing, chewing gum, some of them were chewing gum, and some of them were reading books, some of them were drawing, some of them were fighting with each other, you know how young people are. And I looked at this crowd and I looked down, and in the first row there were all these boys and girls sitting in front of me, and something came over me, something that I don't understand to this day, something that I can't fully explain. But I said something strange to these group of people, and I said to them, I want all the girls to move to the back and all the boys to sit in the front. Now, remember, I knew nothing about Islam. I had never visited a mosque. I don't know any of the traditions or the customs of Islam. This is purely what happened to me. I cannot explain why it happened. It just happened. And so I separated the two sexes. Now, I didn't separate the two sexes because I thought the girls were lesser than the men and the men were more important. I suddenly, for the first time, saw what I saw. I actually saw what my eyes were seeing. And what I was seeing was distractions. And so I remember all the times that I had been a priest or preached uh, as a pastor in the church or I had preached to groups of people, how when I was preaching, I'd look in the front row and there'd be these girls with their little skirts on or these women with their little skirts on and how my mind would start wandering off about other things, things that I shouldn't be thinking about, how I was thinking about lustful thoughts. And I thought to myself, but I've been doing this while I've been preaching while I've been trying to teach the Word of God, if the people in the audience only knew what was in my mind, what I was thinking about, how they would be disappointed with me. And so for the first time when I stood in front of all these people and I separated them, I realized that I was separating people for my own purity. Yes, it might be selfish. Yes, people might think I'm being sexist. Yes, it might, people might think that, that I'm a bad person by doing this. But what am I doing it for? I'm doing it to protect my own mind. I'm doing it to protect myself from what, from what would lead me naturally into sin. Because if you can stand there today, or if you can sit at home today and say that you can sit in front of a, a group of people that are mixed, mixed sexes together, and not have those thoughts, and not be tempted to look at the person sitting next to you that's the opposite sex, or stand at the pulpit and look down and not have temptation, then there's two things either that are wrong with you. One is that you're dead, or two, you need to go see a psychiatrist because there's something seriously wrong with you because we all have that temptation. And if you don't have this temptation, you need to go see a doctor because there's something wrong with you. All of us have these natural feelings and we need to make sure that we don't put ourselves in these temptations. So from this time, I saw the first time separated the sexes. And so I put the men in front and the women behind, the younger boys in the front and the younger girls behind. And as I started teaching and I stood up on the pulpit and I was about to speak, what came out of my mouth is, Islam has everything to offer Christianity but Christianity has nothing to offer Islam. When I had made that statement, I realized what I had said, and I suddenly realized that for the first time, I had spoken a truth that even I didn't fully comprehend. And so I was stuck what I had said. I had already made the statement. I had already said that, that Christianity has nothing to offer Islam, and Islam has everything to offer Christianity. What did I mean by that? And it shocked me to my core that I had said something that I had not prepared, nothing that I had thought of saying, you see, intentionally I thought, what is Christianity to offer Islam? 
But when I stood up there, I realized we have nothing to offer Islam. That Christianity has nothing to offer Islam. And that Islam has everything. What does Islam have to offer Christianity? It ha and then I started to talk to the young people and I said to them, look at the way the male and female relations are in Islam compared to Christianity. We date, we meet, we sleep around, and we use the person, and we move on to the next one, and we date, and we meet, and we sleep around, and we move on to the next person. The first time a Muslim boy and a Muslim girl meet each other is when they meet each other to decide if they're going to get married or not. And this is done with a chaperone. The chaperone will leave them alone for a while, but he'll sit in earshot so he can hear. Then he'll come back, and then the decision will be made whether to be married or not. This marriage is now consecrated. It's protected by God. God is now the one who is in control and protects this marriage. So if the marriage is agreed to go through, then the marriage will take place. It is blessed. There's no getting to know each other. There's no um, sleeping around or anything like that. This is a beautiful marriage, blessed by Allah, blessed by God. And I said, look at crime and punishment. In our country, crime and punishment, you just get a tap on the hand for if you do something. And in Islamic states, there's a very high penalty so this penalty is, is there to prevent people from doing the crime, so there is none of this crime around. What about how we treat our parents and our families? How do we look after the society, the retirement villages? And so I went after point after point, subject after subject, topic after topic, showing how Islam and Christianity, comparing the two, and how everything was different, how Islam was so much better than Christianity, and yet we want to go to Muslims and say, here, take Christianity, this is what we want to give you. And what we have is used, second-hand, no good stuff. Yet Islam comes with the best, the nicest, offers it to Christianity. So how do we possibly think that Christians can offer Islam anything? What Christianity offers Islam is nothing and compared to what Islam has to offer Christianity. And so when I'd finished this talk, you can imagine the reaction. The first reaction was, this guy has been possessed, He's, there's a demon that's taken him over, he needs to take some time off. And so what happened is my church said to me, the congregation said to me, and many of my friends said to me, you need to take some time off. So we're going to take a short break, and when we get back from the short break, I will tell you what happened next. Walking in this great big world. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back. And we were talking about my final days of Christendom. So it came to a point where the church said I need to take some time off, that maybe I was possessed, maybe I was doubting my faith or whatever. So I took a year off. And during this year that I had taken off from, from Christianity, my brother and myself, my stepbrother, or my brother in Islam is, so he came with me and we went and we lived down the coast, near a coast, a coastal area and a coastal town. And while we were living in this coastal town, I did a lot of soul searching, a lot of thinking. But I did not pick up the Quran. I don't know why I said the things that I said, but I just understood by what I understood by Islam, by Muslims, what I'd seen in Muslims. That's what I brought across. Not so much what I'd read in the Quran. But it sat in the back of my mind, and I knew I didn't want to become a Muslim. I thought, no, I don't want to become a Muslim, but you cannot go to Muslims and try and give them something which they've got better than we have. That's what I understood as a Christian. And so this, during this year, it bugged me a lot, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, maybe I must just like, not think about that. Maybe I must just ignore everything that I said, and go back to Christianity and say, yes, I'm sorry, what I said was wrong. Yes, maybe they are living a better people. Maybe they have better rules. Maybe they have better regulations, but they don't have Christ. So maybe that's the way I should just go back and forget about it. So during this year when I was thinking, my brother used to uh, be fascinated with animals and plants and birds and fish. And our house used to be like a zoo. We had every animal you can imagine. We had cats all over the place. We had birds. We had fish, everything. And all of these things needed to be fed. So what we did is we used to do a pilgrimage once every two weeks into the city, and that was about 100 kilometers away. It was about 70, 80 miles away. So we would have to travel about an hour into the town, and we used to go to the shop where we would buy food for the animals. Now, the shop that we went to was owned by, this, by two sisters. And uh, we'd go into the shop, and we'd buy whatever, and every time we went into the shop, this woman would say to me, she said, Sir, before you leave, I just want to tell you one thing. And I'd say, What? And she'd say, there is only one God. And so I'd look at her, and I'd look, okay, whatever, walk off. Every time I came into the shop, the same thing. Sir, before you leave, I want to tell you one thing. There's only one God. Again and again and again, she would tell me this. She, was quite, she used to upset me. And I used to think, oh, this woman, she's crazy. In fact, her nickname became One God. So every time I'd take my brother through, we'd go into the shop, and I'd say to him, listen, I'll be back just now. I'll come fetch you just now from One God. And that was her nickname. Eventually, one day, around February of 2002, 
uh, of this voyage backwards and forwards, about a year of visiting her shop. I went into her shop and she said the same statement to me. She said, listen, I want to tell you something. I said, yes, I know. There's only one God. I said to her, listen, what religion are you? Because I thought she must be a Christian or something. Maybe she's a Jehovah's Witness. Maybe she's a Mormon. Maybe she's a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know what religion she was. And I thought she was trying to get me to come back on the straight path again. And uh, she looks at me and she said, didn't you know I'm a Muslim? And I said, what, a Muslim? And she said, yes. I said, oh, that sums up. No wonder you keep on with this one God, one God thing the whole time. So I walked out of the shop and I was quite upset. A typical Muslim. They'd just blown up a building. Now they want to convert people to uh, Islam. And so I thought, you know, September 11th, it had to be the Muslims who did it. It had to be. And now this woman wants to now convert me to a terrorist religion. Ha, ha, she's crazy. So I just thought, oh, I'm never going to speak to this woman again. Said to my brother, we're never going back to that shop again. This woman's crazy. Uh, if you had told me I was going to a shop where they were supporting terrorism, I'd never have gone to the shop. So as I walked out of the shop, we were going back to the car. And as we're getting back to the car, I said to my brother, no, there's somewhere else I would like to go to. There's a man that I used to debate against when I was a very young Christian still. And his name was Ahmed Didat. And he has an organization called the Islamic Propagation Center. I want to go to that place and I want to tell him what for. I want to tell him what his religion stands for. I want to tell him that his religion is a terrorist group. Tell him all this stuff. And uh, I want to go see him. I want to go. I haven't seen him for years. I want to go speak to this man. Very arrogantly, I walked off. We were both marching down the road. My brother, like, not knowing what was going on, following behind me. But he knew that whatever I said, he sort of followed. And uh, he, he knew that, like, there must be some wisdom in what I was going to go and do. So as we walked down the road and we got closer and closer to this place, uh, to the Islamic Propagation Center in South Africa, I was about to enter this building and push the button to go to the third floor or the fourth floor of this building. I felt a calmness coming over me, one that I couldn't really explain. Just a strange calmness coming over me. Each floor that we went up, the next floor, to the next floor, to the next floor, I felt calmer and calmer and calmer. By the time we got to the fourth floor, that anger that I had had subdued and I felt more logic coming into me. So otherwise, I would have been very aggressive when I got there. I felt there was much more logic inside my brain. I was going to do, uh, speak from a much calmer place. So when we got to the fourth floor, I went into the, the reception area, and I said, can I speak to Ahmed Didat, or Ahmed Didat, as they call him in South Africa? And they said, well, he's not here at the moment. Okay, when I got there, they said that Ahmed Didat had been quite sick and hadn't been in, and he's at home, he's ill, he's been taken ill, so he's no longer at RPCR. But if you want to talk to somebody, there's a man by the name of Ford Hendricks, and he'll be quite happy to speak to you. So my brother and myself, we went into the room where Ford Hendricks was, and he began talking to us. And I said to him, like, you know what? You guys, you claim to be a religion of peace, but you go fly planes into buildings. And so he explained to me, and he said to me, listen, you know, like in Christianity, you had Jim Jones, you had David Koresh, you had all these crazy people in Christianity that did all these atrocities. You had Adolf Hitler was a Christian. You had all these people that claimed to be Christians and murdered so many people. You had Stalin and all these other crazy people in Christianity. Now, we as Muslims don't believe that all Christians are like that. We know that only a small percentage of, of Christians did that. We know that all Christians didn't agree with the Second World War. We know that Christians didn't agree with the First World War. But now you can't paint the whole of Islam because of one or two or three or 10 or 20 terrorists that have done these. Or even if there were 100,000 of them, you can't blame the whole of Islam for this. So, I thought, well, this actually makes sense. He sat and he showed me story by story on how stories that make the news have been blown out of proportion. He explained, for example, that if a Muslim man had to rob a, a person, it would be on the news tomorrow. It would say, Muslim man robs person. But if a Christian murders and kills and maims somebody in, in a city, it says John Smith killed the person. It doesn't say a Christian. And he showed me how the media had purposely twisted everything to make Islam the new enemy, how Islam had become the new KGB, had become the new Russia, and how before Russia it was the Germans, and before the Germans it had been somebody else. It always had to be a bad guy. And at this point in time, Islam was going to be the religion that is the bad guy until the next one came along, and they would now be the bad guy. So I understood that. I thought, okay, well, this makes sense. Then we went through verse and chapter of the Quran where he started to show me the first chapter of the Quran. And he picked up the first chapter of the Quran and he opened, he said, listen, I want you to have a look what the first chapter of the Quran says. And so I opened the first chapter of the Quran. And in the first chapter of the Quran, it says, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And I read another, wow, that is, that is amazing because what it actually says is it says, I'm now introducing you to who this book is. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. I'm going to introduce you to the creator. So I said, well, this word Allah, I've got a problem with this word Allah. Who is Allah? 
why don't you just call him God? And he said, well, God is Allah. Allah and God are the same. You see the name God and the name Allah mean the same thing? They're just translation. So it's the Arabic word or the Arabic word for Lord or God. And we say Allah. Then explain to me how difficult the word God is in English. For example, you can have many gods. You can have demigods. You can have female gods. You can have male gods. You can have all different types of gods. Sometimes when we say God, we actually don't know what somebody is saying when they say that. He said with the word Allah, it's only one name can have Allah. Only God's name can be Allah. I thought, wow, that is amazing. And he said to me, the Quran is like a homepage. You know, if you go on the internet and you open the Quran, the first chapter of the Quran, Surah al fatiha it's like the opening chapter of the Quran is like the homepage. If you're busy browsing on the internet and you come across the homepage, you get, that's the basic, it tells you everything that you're going to find or it should tell you everything that you're going to find in the rest of the book. And so I started reading off Surah Al-Fatiha and I started to realize, wow, if this is what the first chapter is going to tell me about the rest of the book, this is going to be an interesting book. This is the teaser. This is the thing that gets you. This is the advert placement for the rest of the book. And I thought, if Allah is that clever, if God is that clever and that wise to make sure that the first page is the page that's going to catch you and keep you, there must be something to this book. So it started getting me to think. Then we started looking at doctrines. And so we argued for about 10, 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, backwards and forwards. The Trinity, does it exist, doesn't it exist? Is Jesus God or isn't he God? And he started showing me Paul and he started showing me all these different writings and showed me the beauty of Islam. Now, during this time, my brother disappeared. And I looked for my brother and I thought, now, where is he gone? And then I looked for him. He had disappeared. I went down the corridors trying to find him. I came and I said to the guys, like, listen, I know you guys are Muslims and we are Christians. But did you by any chance throw my brother out of the top story of the building? Like, sort of joking, but sort of serious at the same time. And they said, no, 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 no. He's probably in one of the rooms. So I went around, looked around. And as I walked down one of the corridors, I see him walking towards me. And in his hand, he has a yellow card like this and a big smile on his face. And I said, well, where have you been? Have you been gone for like over a half an hour? Where have you been? And he said, I've got something to tell you. And I said, what? He said, I've become a Muslim. I said, oh, no, how can you become a Muslim if they brainwashed you? We came here to argue with these people. Now you come here with a yellow card in your hand and you say you're a Muslim. He said, yeah, yeah, I became a Muslim. What those guys were saying, what they said in that room, what Ford Hendricks said to me, it made sense. And the only thing I could possibly do is take the Shahada. And I said, what is the Shahada? So when we went back into the room where Ford Hendricks was, where the three of us sat there, and he said to me, the Shahada is when you say that there is no other God but God and that the Prophet Muhammad is the final messenger of God. I said, well, I personally, I don't believe in this whole prophethood thing, so I can't take that same part, but I agree with you on the first part. And Ford Hendricks sat me down, and he said, let me explain to you the full details of what it is. And he sat down and he explained to me step by step. Now, immediately I didn't say, okay, it's all clear to me, now I'm going to become a Muslim. It took a while longer because I wanted more information. Now, I'm not going to give the secret away what was actually the key that, that turned me to accepting Islam. In the next episode, we're going to look at what it was that actually turned the key and opened paradise, the hope, the way to me to realize that there is a way to paradise. Remember, the right key fitting into the right lock will open the gates to paradise. So inshallah, we will have a look at this in more detail next time. So from me, Arib Islam, assalamu alaikum. I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim.